Thanks everybody for joining this month's Coffee Talk session. I'm John Paquette, EVP Solutions and Product Strategy for TIS, as well as the host of our Coffee Talk series. And as Cindy mentioned, this month's session is all about supply chain finance. And in particular, how traders can use these programs as part of a broader cash management and working capital optimization strategy. Definitely a topic garnering a lot of attention in the market, driven in part, I think, by macroeconomic factors that traders are facing when managing cash these days, which is a topic that we're gonna to touch on a little bit during the course of the conversation but also because there are truly innovative players sort of moving into the space now, more fintech, non-traditional bank type uh, companies that are really providing strategic, intuitive, frictionless solutions for corporate treasurers to be able to access supply chain finance uh, programs. And I'm very happy to be joined by one of those today. Um, for today's Coffee Talk session, we have Scott Lowen and Andrew Berg from C2FO. Guys, welcome to the Coffee Talk session. Maybe you could take a moment here to introduce yourselves as well. Hey, John, thanks for your time and appreciate uh, kicking off our partnership with this great coffee talk. I'm Scott Lowen, SVP of Channels for C2FO. Uh, my team's responsible for bringing on uh, great partnerships with um, other treasury and fintech solutions to bring treasurers added value for their cash flow and working capital needs. So thanks for your time today. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, John. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for, for attending. Um, I'm Andrew Burns, SVP for EMEA, so responsible for uh, revenue generation in EMEA. Been with C2FO for 10 years, but uh, my background has uh, been about 20 odd years in, in the world of treasury. So originally building up the treasury operation for uh, Motorola back in the mid late 90s uh, and then joining the treasury software world um, in around about 2004. Oh, nice. Yeah, I sort of come from the same background, 15 years as a practitioner and then jumped over to the software side of it back in 2019. So it's interesting to be able to bring the perspectives from both sides. So, right. Yeah, looking forward to the conversation. As Scott sort of alluded to here, it's sort of the reason that we're bringing TIS and C2FO together in one coffee talk session here today is because we've recently entered into a partnership together, which I'm truly excited about, you know, really to bring together you know, C2FO's dynamic supply chain finance capabilities, with TIS's market leading position in the cash management forecasting global uh, payment space. We think there's a lot of interesting synergies that can occur here for uh, corporate treasurers and really add a lot of value to you know, overall cash management, working capital optimization strategies. So we'll try to draw that uh, line a little bit too during the course of the uh, conversation here today. But maybe just to kick things off a little bit, you know, for, us, for our listeners who might be newer to the supply chain finance topic, or maybe just trying to get to that next level of knowledge in terms of really understanding these programs, Maybe we could just generally explain, you know, what is supply chain finance? Why is it becoming a big topic now? Why is you know, sort of market conditions also factoring into this a little bit in terms of treasurers looking to take advantage of programs like this, um, you know, within the recent years? Yeah, I'm happy to take, take that one. Um, so supply chain finance, I think if you Googled it at the moment, it, there'll be a number of different uh, uh, topics or descriptions behind it. So it's a little bit of an umbrella term. Um, but realistically, um, historically, it's boiled down to a couple of solutions. Um, and those solutions are really driving it to different um, supply chain finance and which has been very much bank led uh, together with corporates is a way to generate cash flow by extending the payment terms of a handful of high spend volume suppliers in return for cheaper financing to those suppliers. So big, big suppliers, lots of volume of spend, you extend the payment terms and you say there's cheap funding off the back of our credit rating um, as a buyer for you. So it's much more affordable to you. So you'll get paid early. We get the extension of the payment terms, which means we pay back the bank of the original terms and our working capital is, is optimized. Um, that's been around for about 15, 20 years. Um, it's it's a relatively mature product. It's a very good way of generating cash within that band of suppliers. The second solution that has been around for probably about 10, 15 years is what's called dynamic discounting, which is a very good tool for using excess cash in return for a discount. So you're offering suppliers, and this could be tens of thousands of suppliers, early payment of invoices in return for a discount. And that is funded by your own cash, which means you get the discount, which is basically offset from an accounting point of view, you're offsetting costs of goods sold and improving your EBITDA. So those two solutions are what is the sort of umbrella of, of supply chain finance. Uh, and as I say, have been around for a while. 
I think what we're seeing over the last few years, particularly in relation to the volatility that's hitting the market and, and different economies, um, is a need for flexibility, particularly in the world of supply chain finance. You've got a significant amount of suppliers who can't get access to liquidity or working capital to grow their business or even support their business. Um, particularly here in Europe, 90% of uh, financing for suppliers comes from banks. Now, if banks are deciding not to provide funding to those, particularly SMBs, then you've got a real challenge in the economy. You've also got a challenge for uh, customers who are using those supplies in their supply chain. So it's inherently bringing in risk into the supply chain if your suppliers don't have access to affordable liquidity. Um, <clears throat> This is a reacting. There's a lot uh, going on in the world in terms of uh, moving away from manufacturing sources as one side, from cheap uh, labor to more localized markets where market demand is. Um, and so supply chains are really being rethought throughout the world in different industries, which is creating a lot of pressure for those managing that in businesses to be able to offer incentives to suppliers um, to help suppliers with liquidity to ensure there are no risks in delivery. And so Treasury in particular is having to support this because one of the big pushes over the last 10 years, even since I was in Treasury, is ensuring that you get to the grassroots of, of understanding the business and business risks and supporting those, those business leaders with solutions. Um, and so you've got to be able to adapt to those demands with tools that are flexible enough to cover your complete supply chain and not just a limited number of suppliers in either supply chain finance, which is bank funded, or dynamic discounting, which is funded off your own balance sheet. So what we've seen and what we've been driving is the ability to fund every single supplier in the supply chain, either with your own cash or third party cash from your house banks or new banks, um, and have different pricing mechanisms for different groups of suppliers, all from one platform that allows you then to adapt to different demands in different regions and overall strategy for the company, which then of course brings the treasurer closer to, to strategic initiatives uh, and higher up on the, uh, the pecking order, if you like. Scott, anything to add on that? Uh, that was a, really a perfect answer. The the only thing I thought uh, we could add is just the with rising interest rates globally. That's you know that's a key driver on supplier adoption of programs like C2FO. So if you can be competitive with offering um, early payment at a rate that makes sense for every supplier within your network, that's that's a key differentiator as well. Uh, interesting stuff for sure and it seems like you know macroeconomic conditions probably have pushed these these programs into the forefront from a couple different respects and it's interesting all the different unique challenges that a program program like this can solve so obviously post pandemic huge supply chain issues right lots of organizations super concerned about the health of their supply chain and about delivery and i'm sure that sort of reverse factoring solution that you mentioned probably factored in pretty pretty aggressively there in terms of organizations looking to make sure they maintain that healthy supply chain would you say that is that sort of accurate yeah for sure and you know i think there's different um different solutions in the past which used for different use cases um where we are now with the macroeconomic pressures it's blending into needing to have different um reactivity within the complete supply chain so Previously, we had two different silos. We had supply chain finance, which was for bank funded, for cash flow needs, for probably about 50 to maybe 100 suppliers. And if you're an organization which has 40, 50,000 suppliers, what about all the rest? Okay, you could offer dynamic discounting. But what happens if you need your own cash for other, other reasons? And a lot of organizations now are pivoting towards, okay, we've moved out of the era of cheap, uh, cheap financing. So you need to deleverage to get your finance KPIs back in order. So you need to generate cash, pay down on debt. So you don't want to be using necessarily your own cash unless you've got a cash reserve that you can dip in and out of, say, intra-quarter for reporting periods. So then you, you'd want to finance the dynamic discounting suppliers from third-party banks or third-party funders. In typical dynamic discounting solutions, you can't do that. 
Um, and in supply chain finance solutions, you can't use your own cash or you can't do uh, thousands and tens of thousands of suppliers. So what we looked at was merging all of this and giving the optionality to say, if you want to use your own cash with certain groups of suppliers, great. If not, use third party financing. And that allows you to adapt to different KPIs that are hitting you at different times. If the organization is saying, we don't want to use our cash right now, we want to preserve our cash, bring in third party for all those suppliers. So you're going to see that in different places, different businesses um, driven by uh, economic needs. Um, you know, a really good example of this is, is we have a, a very large um, telecoms company um, who essentially wanted to move away from this siloed approach with supply chain finance with one particular bank and dynamic discounting with a certain group of suppliers um, and so we implemented them across all of their suppliers um, and quadrupled the size of their program from a financing point of view with a combination of using own cash and third-party cash um, mm -hmm. so yeah increasing all of the suppliers so we've now got about uh, seven thousand suppliers on that on that program who are both financed by third party and some through own cash, and that can be adapted. So from a practical point of view, that allows treasurers to say, okay, we, we need to preserve cash at this occasion. Um, when there is an opportunity to have cash, um, additional cash, so you're looking at your KPIs over a quarter end and maybe you've got a lot of cash, invest in your supply chain as a, almost like a, um, an alternative investment instrument. To generate EBITDA. If it's the other way around, generate cash by using third-party financing to ensure you hit your KPIs over reporting periods. So you've got that adaptability over key reporting periods without sacrificing any of the user experience for suppliers and keeping a strong supply chain. That's nice. I mean, to have that amount of flexibility in a program must be a huge advantage for treasurers. Yeah, you mentioned a little bit about sort of using supply chain finance programs, particularly like maybe dynamic discounting as an alternative cash investment for maybe like end of, end of quarter type, you know, balance sheet planning and things like that. Can treasurers use it as more of a like active cash management strategy as well? Like, you know, say, for example, they know they're going to have excess cash at the end of the week for a period of, you know, say five to 10 days. You know, could they look across and see what might be available out there for early pay discounts and what yields those might produce versus, say, dumping that money into a money market fund? And maybe the alternative to that would be, you know, if there's a little bit of lumpiness in the cash flow and they have a couple of periods of cash deficit, could they, you know, instead of drawing on a revolver, maybe look to accelerate some receivables through a program like C2FO? Yeah, I was going to say that's actually the beauty of our program because you get ultimate flexibility on both the AR and the AP side of our solution. So if you're a supplier and you're having that lumpiness in your cash flow and you're like, wow, I, I really just need to get the invoices for the that you know that are outstanding for the last you know month paid, you know, in the next two days, you have that flexibility to request those early payments uh, on any invoices that they want. Um, and then once they're back at a you know at, at a status uh, a good a good working capital position they can back off. Same thing on the enterprise buyer side from an accounts payable standpoint, they could enter a period where they have excess cash that they'd like to invest in their program with dynamic discounting. Um, but then they could be in a working capital uh, position where they want to maintain their cash and they can switch the funding to a banking partner. So. You know, that's one of the key ways we've evolved as a company. You know, we've been in business for 15 years and we started in dynamic discounting. We're really one of the pioneers in the space, but the market told us that treasurers want ultimate flexibility to manage their cash risk, uh, their cash forecasting, et cetera. Andrew, yeah. anything to, to add to that? And, and from that point of view, I was just thinking of another example. We've got a, a global tech company um, who has uh, manufacturing hubs in, in India and China. Um, and a lot of uh, receivables on our program. So a lot of them are offering early pay uh, for their receivables. So what they do is a combination of the treasurer realized that there's a lot of trapped cash in those regions that they can't get out uh, of, of the countries. Um, and so they use early pay using their own cash in country to generate returns on that cash and obviously EBITDA impact that rolls up uh, to the business 
Um, but at the same time then for KPIs over quarter end uh, periods, they're accelerating their receivables from their customers over the quarter end to ensure uh, KPIs are being hit um, uh, over those specific pressure points so that they show good cash returns. So it's, it's a sort of multi-effect of using um, different problem areas, such as trap cash in this example, um, to solve your KPIs and the pressures that you've got. And that's where moving away from these kind of legacy solutions of supply chain finance, which is a great tool, but a kind of one-off benefit of cash and dynamic discounting, again, a great tool, uh, but if you don't want to use your cash, what do you do? Um, so really allowing for the flexibility to come out and adapt to different business needs uh, on the fly. Yeah, well, I'm just gonna, to, oh, sorry, Scott. Go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, just to add to that, you know, we've we've seen, you know, a tremendous diversity across the supply chain where a, a small and medium sized business, you know, their stance as C2FO is like that reserve parachute that they can tap into their invoice financing anytime they want. But then we've got a Fortune 10 large pharmaceutical corporate that literally came in in Q1 and acceler accelerated $600 million in working capital to make sure that their balance sheet was shored up. So I think I think that's really important that, you know, as the as the treasurers of the world are using uh, systems like TIS to, to see where they have cash forecasting um, actions they can take, like C2FO can be right in on that conversation so that they can take action on those needs, regardless of the size of your business. Yeah, I think you're spot. I mean, first of all, the, the, the approach you guys take to this topic, I think, is, is spot on. I think that flexibility is exactly what the Treasury community is looking for. And I, I think I even used the term intuitive, you know, at the beginning of the, of the uh, session here to describe it. And I think from a cash management, liquidity management perspective, the solution is very intuitive from that standpoint. You can bring in a lot of different attributes of supply chain finance programs, but really present it from the level of how does this, how can I drive value in my business through this? And I, I agree completely in terms of the cash forecasting tie-in, right? Like sort of, you know, the, the reason why I'm so excited about the partnership is the tie-in between sort of what we provide our customers, which is a, you know, forecast liquidity, cash requirements, cat, periods of cash uh, 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 surplus or deficits, whatever it might be. But, you know, sort of where it, it drops off is is the sort of the now what, right? If, you know, if I have excess cash or a cash deficit, what should I do there? What's the right decision to make in that, in that from that perspective, given the cash management instruments that I have at my disposal and bring in that C2FO perspective there in terms of, hey, this is how you can optimize liquidity or working capital, whatever it might be, right. is a great tie-in for treasurers for sure, yeah. You know, John, just to, just to add to that, um, that business use case you just described is, is perfect. However, oftentimes treasurers are faced with how do I operationalize this? How do I work with my IT team to actually bring on solutions like C2FO? And we find that um, if we can have that story where it's, hey, we're just one, a simple ERP connection away to giving you that visibility and ability to take those actions, then it becomes more of a, oh, you don't have to disrupt my tech stack. You just have to let us, you know, do a, a a quick spend file exchange uh, a quick uh, connectivity to the erp system to let you focus on your day job and let the technology almost take care of itself i mean you know a system like c2fo if we go direct to a customer it's like a 12-week implementation but when we partner with companies like tis it becomes you know less than a month when you can actually already tap into existing technology so Unlike you know long-term IT projects that can take a year or two, this is simply you know a very short a short lift and a light go to like light go to market process. So, and I think John, to add to that sort of the, the the benefit of the combination, one of the things that is always a challenge within organizations, certainly from my treasury days, is giving perceived value back to the businesses. Um, to be able to earn trust and relationship, et cetera. Because certainly my day when we were centralizing treasury operations, it was always, I'm going to take these things away from you. You may feel like you're losing control, but actually this is going to be beneficial and I can show you the data and, and kind of the reports, how this is helping, helping the organization. Um, so this sort of provides a, a, a value feedback loop that can be a sell to the businesses. So treasury can go to businesses and say, 
I can actually provide you with a real, really valuable tool to strengthen your business, strengthen your supply chain, and impact your cash flow and EBITDA, uh, if it's a, on a localized reporting basis, um, to improve the business dynamics and metrics. So Treasury now has the opportunity to really impact those criteria, particularly EBITDA, um, which previously maybe wasn't a, a remit of Treasury. It was increasing cash returns, et cetera. But now it can really contribute to the business. So that's a, a, a massive selling point to take the businesses. Yeah, I think you're certainly connecting a lot of dots there within the office of the C CFO, where you know you're really looking at ARAP data from a more strategic standpoint of like how can this materialize into some sort of an advantage for our business, and even tying that up to the FP&A team who might be forecasting you know balance sheet categories at the end of the quarter. So I mean, it really connects a lot of dots and gives Treasury a you know valuable tool to be able to really orchestrate and you know sort of act strategically within that. So um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And Scott, to your point about the, the the data synergies, I mean, that struck me as well. I mean, so yeah, we're collecting invoice level AP and AR data from our customers already to forecast their their future cash flows related to those those uh, receivables and payables. And obviously, that's the same data that you guys need to go out into the market and identify opportunities to accelerate AR or you know achieve dynamic discounting on AP invoices and things like that. So there definitely are. I can definitely see the the point that you made about that accelerating the journey for the customer definitely coming to fruition. So. Definitely interesting yeah. points there. Appreciate it. Yep. One other thing, just John, I, I was reflecting on just from the supplier side of this. So we see big corporates being the supplier as well, but having their supply um, really ramping up. One of the things we've been driving for the last 10, 15 years is building the network. And I think this is one of the key differentiators of, of what we've got to offer. Um, and we have quite significant depth across a lot of different industries because this isn't industry specific, this solution. It works as long as you've got suppliers and invoices uh, and suppliers want to get paid, it works. Um, but what we've seen through the data, because we sit on about $3 trillion worth of, of uh, ARAP at any one point in time. So we've got a huge amount of data that's informing decisions. But what we've seen is what we call the multi-buyer supplier effect. Now, that's a, bit of, a little bit of our terminology, so I'll explain what that means. Initially, you'll have a, a buyer, so a big corporate comes on, and we'll have, let's say, one supplier with receivables that it wants to accelerate. Those receivables, maybe it's just $1,000. It's not going to be particularly interesting to have a material impact on that supplier's business. If you add another buyer, we see the acceleration volume go up by four times. If you add a third buyer, it go up, goes up by 11 times. And it's, it's kind of exponential along that. So that the more depth you get in industries, suppliers essentially see us as their primary funding source through early payment because it becomes significantly more material to their business. And all they have to do is, is click on the website, sign in, and they can accelerate their receivables. So their alternative is going to be banks, for example, maybe capital markets. All of that takes time, paperwork, and is wrapped up potentially in, in the regulations of debt. This is a super simple way to get access to liquidity and impact their businesses. Similarly as what we're saying to, uh, to, to the treasurers on, on this call, it's very reactive and adaptable. But imagine if you have that sort of control as a supplier your business is growing you've got demands and you go onto the website and say i want to accelerate a million dollars of my receivables and it's in your bank account in two days and you don't have to do anything else and we had a great example of one supplier that was never really using the platform and all of a sudden came in and accelerated about 10 million dollars worth and we asked what what was the reason behind this and he said my competitor went out of business and I had a great opportunity to buy all of his stock. So I needed the cash immediately. It would have taken me far too long to go to a bank. And that was the reason. So there are many, many different reasons why suppliers use this, you know, from affecting their KPIs over quarter end for liquidity purposes to helping grow their business and, and uh, have additional staff hiring uh, to buying additional stock. So it's, we're really just unlocking that in the supply chain. Um, through all of the data and the outreach services that we've got. We speak to all of these suppliers 
um, and allowing it to be an on, on long-term proposition uh, for all these suppliers. So it's a, it's a very sticky business from that perspective. Yeah, I can see that completely. Um, and that's a really interesting example too, of just a company using the program to be really opportunistic, you know, in terms of accelerating receivables and bringing in cash very, or a lot more quickly than they could under a traditional bank model. So yeah, definitely interesting stuff there. One question I was going to have that probably leans a little bit more toward the onboarding side, and you've answered this, I think, to some extent, is that like how are customer and supplier relationships really impacted by using this type of program? You know, first of all, I think they obviously they must view it as a value add based on you know some of the things that we've described already. But do you think do the customer relationship teams or just relationship management teams in general typically have to get involved in say onboarding all of their suppliers onto the program? Or are they really just tapping into a network that C2FO is built over time and really their suppliers are already participating on that program or maybe some combination of the two? Yeah, that's, do you want me to take that one, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, when I started at C2FO, I actually ran the supplier relationship management team. And one of the, you know, our tenants was we just become an extension of the buyer's uh, supplier relationship management team. So we co-brand everything. We use their talk tracks. Uh, they make the introductions digitally so that they know that this is a credible program, but we take care of everything turnkey from there. Um, John, you kind of alluded to this, but in traditional supply chain financing, a buyer will typically have to get very involved in onboarding those 20 some odd suppliers because the banks don't necessarily have those relationships where they can do it all on their own. So there is quite a, there's a heavier lift on traditional supply chain finance. But with C2FO, we can cover the, that large segment of suppliers from an enterprise standpoint. Uh, we go all the way down to the mom and pops uh, of the world, but we're using more generative AI and digital treatments to take care of those suppliers. But you know, just to give you a sense of scale, we have 300 plus supplier relationship managers all over the world, which is close to 40% of our entire customer base. So from a, you know, um, a focus is for us is that supplier satisfaction with using the program and because they're so satisfied, you know, we have an NPS score that's in the high 70s where anything over 50 is considered world class. So, you know, for me, that's that's one of the most exciting things about C2FO is it's this very high tech, but it's also high touch. And that's that's really made a difference for our business. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think one of the things we saw and learned from supply chain finance you would speak to a lot of treasurers you'd speak to a lot of procurement professionals uh, and they would say it was it's essential to have collaboration within the organization because there's heavy lifting that needs to be done by both particularly procurement organizations who are negotiating those terms um, we learned from that and said we need to make this significantly easier, um, not only for suppliers to be onboarded, but also taking away the heavy lifting from procurement organizations. Because what you'll see is when Treasury is, is tasked with a KPI, uh, they will need procurement's help. And if procurement has been through some sort of supply chain finance program in the past, which may not necessarily have been successful, they will be reluctant to do it because it's such heavy lifting. So we removed all of that heavy lifting. Yes, we like to work together with procurement, but more from them making decision making as to how, which suppliers to use. But we provide through all the data we've got, through the outreach services we've got, we provide all of that onboarding, uh, as well as the technology, making it easy as possible. So a few clicks into the application, removing all of that paperwork, uh, we don't need that um, necessity. Um, so that now it allows treasurers to go to procurement colleagues and say, you don't have to do all of that heavy, heavy lifting. We've got it covered. And is the example of the, the telecoms company. We did all of that. We quadrupled the size of the program through our outreach services and the procurement organization didn't do, have to do anything. So it makes a massive difference when you're looking again at these things. One of the hardest things internally is, is getting these projects over the line and having to sell them internally to, to different stakeholders. If you can take away all of that perception of workload and just say it's looked after, it's gonna be much, uh, much quicker implementation. It's gonna be a much quicker value proposition to, to the ROI. 
Yeah, it yeah. also makes it easier for, for Treasury to sell that concept to a procurement lead who is used to having to do the heavy lifting. So it, it, it makes the collaboration between the teams a lot easier for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have to imagine that's one of the big objections Treasury probably faces internally in trying to sell this program is how much work is it going to be on the procurement team, which obviously is a really innovative, smart approach to, to addressing that. And then obviously how much work is it going to be on the IT team is always the other thing that always comes up in these Treasury projects, which, you know, obviously we spoke a little bit about the data requirements and the synergies there as well, too. So, um, yeah, and no, I think it uh, makes a whole lot of sense. And um yeah, Scott, I, I'm glad you kind of briefly touched upon AI. I think in the in the in the standpoint of using it in the supplier onboarding uh, process mostly, but I'm glad you did because it's a good segue. It seems like we can never do one of these conversations without talking about AI's impact on this topic on a go forward basis. So maybe I get you guys' thoughts on that a little bit too. Is there, you know, I guess there's there opportunities to make this process more seamless or to transform it in any way using AI? Is there anything you guys sort of see as uh is shaping a lot of these initiatives on a go forward basis? Yeah, look, I think AI is going to transform the world and is already. You know, we, we, we maybe haven't woken up to it yet, but uh, I think there is no doubt that the landscape in even a few years is going to be significantly different. Um, we already use AI technology in our in our platform and, and with all the data that we have, um, there's significant opportunity to help businesses with that technology. Um, I think the key thing that we've always talked about when we, we look at treasury software is is the data has to be uh, real, it has to be of value and not rubbish, rubbish in, rubbish out. There's always been the quote. Um, so you've got to make sure that the data is, is significant, have really good sources of, of data, true sources of data, and that's where I think this combination uh, of TIS and uh, C2FO's data is going to make a significant impact um, with the AI tools that we already have in place. My view on AI is actually, with the treasury hat on, slightly nuanced, thinking about what is going to be the transformational impact of AI on the business, and how does treasury therefore have to react to support that? And that again goes back to what are the conversations that are being had with those business leaders uh, to understand the transformation that is coming to their organizations and potentially the supply chain, and how can that be supported? Because that's going to be the quicker reaction. Um, AI tools are there at the moment that they're going to help and support that. But the first decision that has to be made and first insight is what is going on in the business for a treasury to be able to support it. And that's really the the that's kind of my take on the impact of AI and, and the way that people should be thinking. Yeah, I think we, we take a similar view at TIS. It's amazing how much a lot of the large corporates out there have started thinking about their data management strategies <laughs> before they think about their AI strategy, because I think they definitely recognize, you know, the garbage in, garbage out principle and just, you know, sort of how much data is actually needed to actually drive good decisions through using AI and things like that. But I mean, we couldn't agree more. It's going to be truly transformational. And, you know, from the treasury sort of cash management standpoint that we've been speaking to a little bit during the course of this session, I think it's about helping treasurers get to the decision point quicker, you know, through using AI, speeding up that analysis, pointing out the insights that they should really be paying paying attention to. The, you know, I guess the, the, the those insights that might lead to actual actions, better cash management actions, and things like that. There's a lot that that um, that AI can really do there for treasurers, um, and really facilitating a lot of that more opportunistic, active cash management. So I'm excited to see that too, and um, I can definitely see the tie-in to programs like what C2FO offers here in terms of allowing customers to actually figure out what the right action is, what the most advantageous action is based on you know, the different cash management instruments they might be using out there. So I think it's, there's definitely a, uh, a strong play there for, for AI to, to improve these processes as well. Yep. As we kind of come to the uh, conclusion of our conversation here, I know we covered a lot of ground during the course of this this uh, session here, but just wondering if you guys have any sort of final words or things you might not have touched upon you think that might be interesting to the listeners. I, I think I would say, you know, final words on this one, just um, everybody is sort of heads down in, in their day-to-day -day business. Uh, there's a lot of pressure going on. I think every so often it's it's necessary to, to pull back and say, okay, what are the connective tools and the best practice influence that these tools can have 
within the organization that I can take and really use to affect positively the relationship between treasury and the business in a kind of circular feedback, like I was talking about before. So the beauty of what we've got here is being able to have treasury having the tools to get accessibility to um, information and reporting that informs where the challenges are, where the opportunities are, and then be able to action that to the benefit of the business, which ultimately then strengthens treasury. Um, and through this kind of proposition, you know, we talked about using excess cash as a, as a lever to invest in, in as a sort of alternative investment instrument. But let's not forget that actually the discounts that are being driven from the supply chain in helping suppliers um, can be used to improve budgets. Treasury for the very first time is impacting EBITDA. So that is a leverage internally when you're talking about um, budgets and budgets coming around because in this environment where there is a lot of pressure on organizations, stakeholders to reduce costs, Treasury is having to constantly justify what they're doing in an organization that doesn't always understand what Treasury does. So to be able to go back and say, I've got insight into these challenges, but I've also got opportunity to generate returns for the business, um, just gives you a better hand at, at uh, the budget discussion. No, I think yeah, that's and I just, so Scott, I don't know if you had any points to add there. Yeah, I was just going to bring up the concept of a safe zone, which is really the, the whole concept of having strategic partnerships like TIS is so a current treasury customer can feel safe sitting down and just having a uh, discovery conversation to see how we might be able to impact their, you know, their working capital, their EBITDA or other overall cash forecasting needs. And oftentimes, you know, to take a take a call with a fintech company, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get bombarded with salespeople. That's not that. It's literally the the safe approach where, you know, a single conversation where they can review the TIS and C2FO information that we've developed together. Um, we can provide easy back of the napkin business cases where within a within literally a week we can tell them what the opportunity is. And then they can make an informed decision. This is a, a very, um, it's a very, it's a great opportunity to learn something new as we've done today on the coffee talk, but also to to see how they can make a a material impact on the business by just looking at the data in a different way, which is which is super exciting for me, you know, as a as a partnership leader. But even more exciting that, you know, I've been at C2FO for 13 years. I think, guys, earlier you were rattling off 12, 13 years. We've got 50 years of experience here. So I just would would love to uh, to bring that that knowledge to, to the, the TIS customer base because I think we've got a lot of um, a good ideas to share. Yeah, no, definitely appreciate that. Yeah, I think we're totally alive from that perspective too in terms of how TIS approaches customer conversations as well as truly a partner, just trying to help people figure out if these programs fit in right for them and, you know, just try to educate them <clears> a little bit the different strategies that are out there that some of their peers are starting to adopt as well. So yeah, I appreciate that guys. Um, I know we wanted to save about five, 10 minutes here for Q and A at the end here, which I think we've done a pretty good job. So Cindy, maybe I'll bring you back on here to see if we got any questions that came in from the audience during the course of the session. Sure. And uh, there's one that was asked by a few folks here, uh, and that is uh, how long does it typically take to start generating returns with C2FO? Who would like to take that? Yeah, happy to take that. So the implementation, as Scott said, typically takes 12 weeks. Um, and once we've started, we have what's called the go live, uh, um, which is essentially the communication. We've already started communication out to suppliers. We've already done the analysis with which suppliers are already in the network and using uh, the platform. Um, so really from that go live day, you're generating returns because the suppliers are giving discounts to be paid early. So that's the beauty of this, this kind of approach if you're looking at it from um, using your own cash. Um, if you're looking from it uh, to, to help suppliers, there is under IFRS certainly, we can, um, you can still have some of the discount even if it's funded by third party banks. Um, not necessarily the case under US GAAP, but it's day one as soon as you go live, you're creating 
discounts from suppliers. And, and I would just add from a ROI standpoint, we look at the data and it's around six months from a return on investment standpoint, because you, you know, you're, you're paying an implementation fee and a subscription fee, but you're going to see within the first six to 12 months, you're going to get a return on that investment really quickly. Awesome. Thank you both. Uh, another question here from uh, Margo. How does C2FO work alongside banks to bring innovation without disrupting those relationships? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's really interesting when you think about banks, um, because the last thing we want to do is disrupt banks, because they're core to obviously treasury relationships and, and um, the balance sheet leverage for organizations. So banks, for the most part, really don't want to go down the route of software development. They have to uh, spend a lot of money. They're not necessarily adaptable to the different requirements. It's not necessarily the best uh, best solution. So we took the stance of allowing banks to come into our network to provide funding. <clears throat> so we look after the software, the tech stack, the outreach services, um, and actually banks were super interested in this because if you think about that three trillion dollars of accounts receivable, accounts payable that we got on the platform, the funding opportunity for banks is massive outside of their typical structure which is normally 50 to 100 suppliers so we're increasing the opportunity for banks to provide more funding without the cost of software or outreach services so it's very attractive to them so what we've actually found is with um, customers going to their house banks and saying hey can you fund this is a very good response because also it helps with the wallet share you can provide a new solution and revenue making opportunities for house banks which obviously helps in that wallet share negotiation um, you can invite new banks in or you can get access to the banks we've already got in the network so you're not exposed to potentially you know single uh, bank-led scf programs supply chain finance programs where one bank is heading and funding that program, if they decide to pull out of that sector or that uh, industry, uh, that um, um, solution, then you're a little bit exposed. In our platform, we have multiple different banks who can fund depending on your, your needs and you choose how to do that. So actually it enhances the bank relationships. The other thing to add is that because we offer programs that cover ESG goals, so there's lots of banks that want to uh, extend spend to diverse businesses, women-owned businesses, uh, sustainable businesses. To Andrew's point, they see partnering with C2FO as an advantage because they can address the needs uh, of those customers through those, those unique programs, which has been one of the fastest growing areas of our business um, over the last two years. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andrew, Scott, and John. I think uh, we're coming up on time here. If there are any additional questions, uh, we will reach out directly to answer those. Um, and as a reminder, we will be sending out a recording of the session to all of the attendees. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you all for speaking. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and if anybody's interested to learn more about the topic, always feel free to reach out, you know, on LinkedIn or through email. I'm sure Andrew and Scott are willing to connect as well, just to chat a little bit more. We know it's a complex topic to untangle, and if we can do anything to help, we're uh, we're more than happy to. So, just to echo some of these points, thanks everybody for joining the Copy Talk session here today. We hope to see all you guys on the next one as well. Take care. Thanks, Cheers. Thanks, all. Bye.